In this lecture, we're going to discuss microarray technology. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to list the steps involved in biochip and microarray technology, identify the types of microarray probes, list and describe the applications for microarray technology, analyze basic microarray readouts based on fluorescence color and intensity, and design a clinical situation where microarray technology may be used effectively. Chip. This is a collection of miniaturized test sites, which are is the, what your microarray is, arranged on a solid substrate that permits many tests to be performed at the same time in order to achieve higher throughput and speed. So a biochip surface area is no larger than a fingernail. So a biochip is a collection of microscopic DNA, RNA, or protein spots that are attached to a solid surface. And this solid surface can be glass, such as a microscope, uh, microscope slide, it could be plastic, it could be a silicon chip. And these nucleic acids are affixed or spotted onto the solid surface. And the fixed DNA, RNA, or protein are what are referred to as probes. And these probes can be DNA, they could be complementary DNA, they could be RNA, they could be protein, they could be oligonucleotides, which are short fragments of single-stranded DNA that are typically between 5 and 50 nucleotides in length. So they're similar to a primer. Microarray technology is identical to southern blotting. That's where it was derived from. However, in, in southern blotting, you have your, your DNA that's attached to your substrate, like a nitrocellulose membrane, and then you probe it. Very similar with your microarrays. It's just that you're not running gels and using nitrocellulose. Everything is done on a chip. So here's a picture of uh, a, an example of a biochip and different companies have different styles of chips and different readers and you can actually make your own chips um, and there are people that do this where you actually spot your um, sample and make your own little chip. So a D microarray, so we talked about biochips there's many names for these things. You have biochips, you have gene chips, you have a DNA chip if it's specifically DNA, a gene array, a microarray. So there's many different just arrays for short. There's different names for the same thing. So for in this example, it's specifically a DNA microarray where you have a collection of microscopic DNA spots. Usually are there, each spot is going to be a gene. And these are arrayed or spotted on a solid surface through covalent attachment to chemically suitable matrices. So these DNA arrays are different from other types of microarrays because they're measuring DNA or DNA is being used as part of the detection system. So like we said previously, you can have an RNA array, a DNA array, a protein array. There's many different arrays that, that you can use. And in your DNA microarrays, you have qualitative and quantitative measurements that are utilizing the selective nature of DNA-DNA or DNA-RNA hybridization under high stringency conditions, just as you would for a southern blot, as well as floor-to-floor based detection. So you're, you're usually in these arrays looking at fluorescence intensities. So here's an example of a spotted oligo microarray. So your oligos are short, single-stranded DNA pieces. And so your entire array, array has many, many, many spots on it. So if you take one of those sections and blow it up, you can see your array. And after you run your array, you're going to get the development of different colors. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this lecture. So here again is that one 
um, square on your entire array. So when after you do your experimentation on your array and you do your hybridization, you're going to scan it. The machine is going to read the fluorescence intensities and colors and it's going to be interpreted by computer using software. So the intensity and the, the color encode information on a specific gene because each spot represents a specific gene. So let's say this is a cDNA array. You have complementary DNA. That's indicative to the abundance of messenger RNA that you had in your original sample. If you remember, you extract messenger RNA and you use reverse transcriptase to convert your RNA into complementary DNA. And then you could use that complementary DNA to look at expression levels. So what was that messenger RNA expressed? And under a certain condition, is it expressed at a higher or lower level? And the nice thing about arrays is you can look at and measure messenger RNA using complementary DNA and look at the expression levels for thousands of genes all at the same time as opposed to doing something like reverse transcriptase PCR where you would have to have a separate PCR reaction for each specific gene. So all of this is done on the same array all at one time. So your applications for microarrays. So microarrays are exactly what we, we just said. Spots and, or arrays where you have your spotted nucleic acids or proteins that are spaced out on a chip. And you could use this for many different things. So for example, you can use microarrays for messenger RNA or gene expression profiling. You can monitor the expression levels of thousands of genes all at the same time. This is highly relevant to many areas of biology and medicine. You could study treatment. You know, if you if you treat a person with a specific drug, what do, what do the genes do in response to that drug? To that drug, are they expressed, overexpressed, underexpressed? You could look at specific diseases, developmental stages. So microarrays can be used to identify disease genes or susceptibility genes by comparing gene expression in disease cells compared to normal cells. You can use microarrays to do comparative genomic hybridization to assess large genomic rearrangements. You could look for smaller things like single nucleotide polymorphisms, and they have arrays to detect SNPs. So you're looking for those single nucleotide changes in the genome of populations. You can also use arrays to do chromatin immunoprecipitation to determine protein binding site occupancy, occupancy throughout the genome. So your microarray is an orderly arrangement of samples. So that's your array. Your, your the array is that orderly arrangement, and it's approximately 200 microns apart, so the spacing. So they're very close together. You're going to match your known and your unknown DNA samples. It's based on complementary binding of your base pairs between your detection probe and your sample probe that's on your chip. And usually these are all read through an automated process since you have thousands and thousands of, of spots on your chip. You need to have a methodology to read the results. There are also automated arrays that are out there and all of these are made and read and everything is done through robotics. So here's an example of DNA that's on a microarray. So you could see the the chip, and then the chip is is put into a little case, and you could see your chip has different regions on it, and within each region you have 
many, many, many spots of nucleic acid. So here an animation you can go to, and this animation is really nice because it gives you an example of the type of experiment you can use using a microarray. Now this particular animation talks about yeast cells, but you can do this for any type of cells, eukaryotic cells, microbial cells, whatever you would like to do, you can design an array for that purpose. Okay, there's many commercial arrays out there. So way back when arrays first started, they were based on southern blots. So a lot of people were making their own arrays. They were spotting their own arrays and had their own systems to read the arrays. Well now, just like you know, most other te uh, metho methodologies, Companies have commercialized arrays and you can buy kits. So you can buy an array for a specific organism or you can buy a eukaryotic array with the entire human genome on it and then you could use that for whatever you need. Now the thing about these commercial arrays is if you buy their array, you need their equipment to read the array and these array um, readers are extraordinarily expensive. So usually people that are running a lot of arrays, maybe an entire department will buy a specific brand of array reader and then everyone in the department would would purchase that brand of array. So, you know, everything is becomes commercialized, which is very nice because everything is very becomes very easy to use and there's controls built into them. However, when you can you're forced to only use that one specific piece of equipment, it can become challenging, especially when better equipment comes up down the road, but you just spent a hundred thousand dollars on that piece of equipment, so you can't buy the better piece of equipment. Okay, so one of the commercial array companies, and probably one of the largest and most commonly used, is the Affymetrics. Um, Affymetrics is a company that's been around for a long time, and you could purchase arrays through them. E-Sensor is another array. Um, they specifically have a cystic fibrosis carrier detection array. And it comes in a kit. The kit includes all the reagents that's necessary for amplification as well as mutation detection. It also has controls to confirm the test validity. It has built-in monitors to detect your amplicon contamination. So it's a really nice kit that is available. Here is the e-sensor chip and the e-sensor reader that you need to read these biochips. So here is the working chip of the e-sensor. So each electrode is electronically active and detects a different DNA sequence and is based on finding the complementary sequence in the target DNA which is then going to generate an electrical signal. So each e-sensor DNA detection system cartridge can detect several different DNA targets simultaneously. Each electrode recognizes a different DNA sequence. You have a capture probe on the electrode and also a signaling probe in the reagents and these are labeled with ferrocene. So then here is the reader, and all these readers are usually hooked up to computers with so specific software for that system so you could read the results. So you would put your biochip in the reader, and your computer and software is going to interpret the data. Here's another system, and this is fully automated system called an arrayer. Here's another fully automated system called the NanoChip 400. And here's your 
um, chips that are the nano chip uses. So it's another electronic microarray. And in this microarray, you have your bound target, you have your oligonucleotide probe, you have a little linker that's going to attach, you have a polyacrylamide matrix, very, very thin matrix, you have your free target that's, that you're going to use to look for hybridization, and all of this is done in an aqueous environment. Here is the code link system. And again, typical array um, technology where you have all of your spots on your surface. You could purchase different formats. So one format is a cDNA probe or complementary DNA where you have 500 to 5,000 base long immobilized cDNA on a solid surface. There are robotics that spot these cDNA spots on that surface. Every single cDNA spot has a unique sequence and you could use it to determine the level of messenger RNA expression produced by a collection of cells. Another format in this system is an oligonucleotide or oligo or peptide nucleic acid. So in this oligo system, it's a 20 to 80 mer oligo. So there are 20 to 80 nucleotide single-stranded DNA. You could have peptide nucleic acids and your DNA is then going to be added and it's going to hybridize to complementary little oligomers that are on your chip and then you could read if hybridization has occurred. So these systems, a lot of these systems are going to begin with amplification. So you need to amplify all of the genes or whatever it happens to be that you're testing. So your sample could be amplified using polymerase chain reaction. You may add a fluorescent tag to your sample and then that is going to be added to your chip. And then however, whatever cells you might be using for to test, you're going, that nucleic acid is going to complementarily bind to sequences with the complementary nucleic acid sequence. You're going to wash off any unbound sequences. This is just like a southern blot. And then because you tagged with fluorescence, you're going to excite the fluorescence using a laser. And then the computer system is going to quantify the fluorescence levels. So microarrays have a lot of research capabilities. You could use microarrays to do functional genomics. You could use this if you know the sequence of the gene you might be looking at. And you could also identify the role of genes. What you would want to do is see if you had complete matches or complete hybridization where you would get bright fluorescence or maybe a single base mismatch where you do get hybridization but it's just not quite as specific and you're going to get a dimmer fluorescence and all this is going to be analyzed by special software. You can use rays for drug studies so you could see if a drug turns on or makes a gene expressed so your messenger RNA is going to differ with each gene and you're going to compare that messenger RNA with cells that were exposed to drug compared to cells that were not exposed to the drug. You're going to apply your cells to the chip and you're going to see which genes are turned on that were exposed to the drug compared to those that were not exposed to the drug. So here would be a drug effect array where you have your messenger RNA from an inactive gene. You have a region there that's an active gene. You're going to extract your RNA. You're going to make complementary DNA from your RNA. You are then going to also have cells that were exposed to the drug. You're going to 
extract the messenger RNA from those cells and make complementary DNA. You're going to tag your complementary DNA from your RNA from the cells that were exposed to drug with a different color than you would for your cells that were not exposed to the drug. So you have two different fluorescent tags on your different cell types and then you're going to hybridize those to your gene chip or biochip and you're going to see where you get hybridization. So for example, if you had green fluorescence, it would mean that you had complementary DNA from your untreated cells. If you had red fluorescence, it means your complementary DNA from your treated cells hybridized. If you have a black signal, that means that neither hybridized. So that black is just the DNA that's on the chip. So then you're going to use the computer to in the software to get your results. So first the, the reader is going to read the results and then bring all the results to the computer and then the computer is going to give you a red to green ratio. So in strongly um, increased activity of treated cells, you're going to get a nice right, bright red um, blob. If you have strongly decreased activity in treated cells, you're going to get a green color. If you have equal active in treated and untreated, meaning you're going to get, you know, green and uh, red equally, you're going to end up with kind of yellows and oranges. And if both are inactive, you're just going to get your DNA chip spot, which is going to be black. You can use arrays for pharmacogenomic genetics and genomics. So you could look for new drugs. You could see how do these drugs affect uh, cells. What are they doing? You can identify genetic or physiologic effects. You could look for adverse drug reactions. So you have a new drug, and you want to compare the overall expression to a known toxin to figure out is the new drug toxic. If it is toxic, you wouldn't want to use it. So you're going to use your arrays and look for your different color spots. And if you saw all green um, spots, you'd know your drug was non-toxic. If you saw more red spots, then you would know your drug is toxic. So you'd want to look to in the area of the new drug and say, hmm, is this drug going to be toxic or not? And would we want to use this new drug? You can optimize drug dosing. So you want to see, if you use a specific drug, how many responders, people or cells, in this case cells, are ever going to respond to that drug. You want to see which cells don't respond to the drug and which cells actually have a, t a bad reaction to the drug. So that would be toxic responders. You could use arrays for cancer studies to look at gene expression, looking to see if if the expression levels differ as a tumor grows and progresses, you can compare the gene expression levels of normal cells to malignant cells in different stages of cancer. You can look for genetic events that may occur as the cancer develops. And you can look at the abundance of genes that might be expressed in a specific cancer. You can look for regulatory gene defects in cancer. So for genetic diseases, you could look for inappropriate gene transcription, maybe too much transcription, too little or no transcription, so you're not going to end up getting a protein where you would need one. You could look at regulatory genes and see if there's a defect in the regulatory gene, which is going to control the transcription of other genes that may be necessary for a specific specific disease. You look for constitutively 
active cells, so these cells are, or these genes are going to always be transcribed regardless of regulatory influ influences, and may be increased or decreased by regulatory genes. So constitutively um, active or constitutive genes are commonly used as controls in many molecular based studies because they're always there and they're usually there at the same level regardless of the time, regardless of the conditions, they're always expressed and usually at the same level. So they're a very nice control. You can see if a cancer is genetically heterogeneous. So you can look at several different independent regulatory gene defects. You can look at missing or damaged genes. You can look at specific genes and how they relate to cancer prognosis and treatment. You can also pinpoint transcription differences between normal cells and cancer cells and possibly identify therapies to target different varieties of the same disease. So is there a specific treatment that might be more appropriate or more effective for a, a, a mutation than another treatment? For genetic differences, you can do your your mutation and polymorphism analyses through microarrays instead of your typical genetic testing. We already said you can do treatment testing, which treatment will work best for which cells, which treatment won't work at all. You can link diseases and genes. So maybe finding a gene alteration that is different from wild type. You can make a biochip with all the different types of genetic alterations that may exist. You can look for susceptibility genes for a specific cancer, a specific um, disease. So for example, for breast cancer, you'd be able to use a, t a chip to detect all the different types of mutations of the BRCA1 gene and also use it to identify heterozygous carriers. You can use chips for chronic diseases like coronary artery disease. So looking at things like angiotensin converting enzyme. So for example, if you had a polymorphism such as an insertion or a deletion, you would know based on the polymorphism if that individual would have a successful angioplasty. So would that person be a good candidate to have a stent put into their artery to keep it open or do they need full bypass surgery and a replaced artery? So if that person had a, a, was homozygous for a deletion, then that means that that person has a high likelihood of having failure if you put in a stent. So in that particular individual, you would want to do a full bypass surgery and replace the artery as opposed to giving them a stent. So these types of um, assays can really tell you not only what disease a person might have, but exactly what types of mutation or expression levels might be different and if a certain treatment option is appropriate for that individual or not. You can arrays for infectious diseases and identify an unknown organism or identify an appropriate treatment for a specific organism. Molecular techniques, as we've already said, are really great for slow-growing organisms such as mycobacteria or your fun fungi. So instead of having to wait three or four weeks for an organism to grow, you can just detect the nucleic acids and know what infection you might have. You can look for antimicrobial resistance genes such as MEK-A for Staphylococcus aureus or the VAN genes for vancomycin resistant enterococcus. You could screen donor blood very rapidly and look in one sample if the person might have HIV, Hep B, Hep C, Cytomegalovirus, West Nile virus.
So the advantages of using arrays for diagnostics and uh, gene polymorphisms, you can detect a problem before the disease develops. So this is going to allow for early tr treatment, allow for appropriate treatments to be used, and improve chances of survival. So you can, you're searching for many different genetic alterations simultaneously, which is going to increase the number of tests that are done and shorten the length of time to perform the tests, which in the long run is very cost effective. You could use arrays for comparative hybridization experiments to determine gene changes specific to an, an environmental condition. So you can see maybe what cells are stimulated, meaning they're transcribed. You can look at their transcription levels and compare those to controls. You can look at different samples at various points in time and see how the transcription patterns change. So this is very important to look at which genes might change in response to a specific environmental stimulus and which may not change and maybe give a clue to a mechanism of a disease. There are ethical concerns with many of the uh, molecular techniques, especially microarrays, because microarrays may allow you to identify conditions where there is no therapy available. So a person can possibly find out that they have some sort of condition that there is no treatment for. So then you would have to provide genetic counseling. Also, you'd want people to have confidentiality of their genetic information. So you wouldn't want that to get out, that a person has a specific condition and then they may be denied for insurance or they may not get employment because of that specific condition. So that's a huge ethical concern. Also, people patent genes and if one company has a patent on a specific gene. Could you, you know, if you were a different company or you're a person wanting to make an array, can you not use that gene because someone else has the patent on it and can only that individual do all the tests for that specific gene? So you get into ethical concerns about that as well. Okay, proteomic or proteomic, however you want to say it, research. The objectives of this are to quantify the proteins in a cell. So this is functional studies of thousands of proteins all done in parallel. And these are also microarray based. So you can study protein-protein as well as protein-ligand interactions as well as protein-drug interactions. So for protein arrays, you would have antibodies to a protein on your chip. So in this example, they're antibodies to infectious agents, anthrax, smallpox, influenza. Then you're going to add a blood sample. And if you have specific proteins in the blood, you're going to get hybridization or your sandwich, your typical sandwich assay that you would get in a serological assay. So you apply your specimen to your array. You have your antibodies that are on the grid. And if you have your proteins from that specific organism in the blood, you're going to get binding to the antibody on the chip. So your fluorescently labeled antibodies are on your chip. Your antibody is going to bind to your protein. You're going to get your sandwich array, and you have fluorescently labeled probes. So if you have a labeled antibody, you're going to be able to detect that. So how to detect is in your scanner. You put your biochip or microarray into your scanner, and then your scanner is going to read, send to the computer. And if you get hybridization, you would end up getting a fluorescence, which might indicate a specific infection, in this case, anthrax. So proteomics and drug research, you can do protein drug arrays. So with which protein does a drug react to? 
and all of the or the the major long-term goal for all of the different types of omics like proteomics and metabolomics and genomics and as well in, as your array technology is individualized medicine so each person has their own chip with their all of their genetic information on the chip and they would have individualized medicine so if they were to get a, a specific disease you would know exactly what mutations were there and based on those mutations what is the best treatment option so that's that's the goal of all of this new technology is in the future to have personalized medicine. So for example, comparing gene transcription in different cells. So you have two different cells. You're going to isolate your messenger RNA from both cells. You're then going to convert your messenger RNA into C complementary DNA using reverse transcriptase, and you're going to label your complementary DNA from each cell with a different color fluorescence. So from cell number one, you're going to label with a green fluorescence. In the second cell type, you're going to label with a red fluorescence. You're then going to take your labeled complementary DNA and you're going to hybridize to your chip. So maybe only one of your complementary DNA from your one cell is going to hybridize to a specific area on the chip or a specific gene. DNA from the other cell is going to hybridize to another gene on the chip and both the complementary DNA from both cells will hybridize to another spot on the chip. So then the laser is going to look for the different colors and that's going to indicate hybridization. And then you can visualize the genes using the label laser and the readout that's going to go to the computer. So here's the problem with microarrays. Quantitation, so you might get irregular spots. There could be dust on a, a slide or an array that's going to not allow that array to be read properly. You might get nonspecific hybridization, so the same types of, st of problems you would get with your typical blotting technology. The intensity threshold. So you have to measure background levels. So you're going to get background readings. You might get hybridization to the wrong spot or non-specific hybridization to the slide. So you can't just measure all levels of fluorescence. You have to only measure over a specific threshold. And where you set that threshold is going to change the stringency of the assay. If you have low levels of cDNA or DNA or protein or whatever you happen to be using, you might not get good enough hybridization. And also, with microarrays, the main problem is variability. So if even within the same lab, if you do a microarray, at one time and then someone else in the lab does the same array using the same sample, you might get slightly different results. So there's intralab and interlab variation with array technology. And we're going to end with our cartoon and if you have any questions on this lecture, you can post them on the discussion section.